Hi, and welcome to the Vermont Lead Poisoning Prevention, Inspection, Repair, and Cleaning Practices Training, or IRC. This training is put on by the Asbestos and Lead Regulatory Program at the Vermont Department of Health. You can contact us through email at ircompliance at vermont.gov. The reason we're here is that lead poisoning can cause harm to adults and to children but we specifically um, look at children as one of the ones most affected by lead. And the reason being is that lead is a neurotoxin that affects the brain, um, brain development, and actually all bodily organs. It can cause attention deficit problems, behavioral issues, uh, lack of impulse control, lack of empathy, all things that um, can affect how you learn and how you uh, deal with society. Children engage in hand-to-mouth behavior and they ingest or eat the lead. Um, the hand-to-mouth behavior is a normal behavior that all children do, so you can't stop the behavior. Therefore, you need to create an environment in which the behavior can be done safely. So that needs to be an environment where there aren't any lead hazards. Adults usually um, get lead poisoned if they are doing unsafe work and they breathe in the lead. So if they're a contractor who is doing unsafe work practices, if they have a job or a hobby that works with lead, somebody making stained glass, things like that, um, you're breathing in the lead as an adult and in, as a child, they're eating the lead. There are secondary sources for um, childhood lead poisoning specifically or adult poisoning as well. Um, toys, some toys, especially toys that are made out of the country um, can have lead and you also need to look at um, toys versus collectibles. Um, some things that look like toys that, like I've seen at Tractor Supply, John Deere tractors, that look like they're toys, but if you look on the box, it says collectible, and a collectible does not have to follow the same lead rules as a toy. So a, a collectible can actually have lead paint and things like that on it where a toy would not. So you need to kind of know whether it's a toy versus a collectible. Um, there's been problems in the past with long burning uh, candles where they had a little piece of wire in the wick that turned out to be lead. Um, bullets and bullet making, of course, bullets contain lead. So if you're melting down lead wheel weights to make bullets, um, it's going into your breathing zone as you heat up and vaporize the lead. Fishing sinkers, cultural remedies, uh, window blinds, furniture, antiques, vintage furniture, the furniture itself, because the distressed look is kind of in, but also refinishing the furniture, um, making maple syrup, some of the old sat pans, the old buckets, um, they use lead solder. So those can all be issues for lead as well. When does this IRC practices law apply? It applies in all pre-1978 residential rental properties and child care facilities. Um, the big thing to know is that if it's pre-78 and it's a rental property, child care facility, all surfaces painted and stained are assumed to contain lead unless proven otherwise. And the only way to prove otherwise is not those swab kits that you can buy at the hardware store. In Vermont, the only thing that counts for proving that a surface does not have lead is a licensed lead inspector with an XRF machine that tests the surface and you then get a written report that says no lead was found. Um, other than that, all surfaces, you have to assume that they're lead. Even if you're the one that painted it five years ago, if it's part of the old building, it's considered to be positive and less proven negative. The basics of the law are to conduct a visual inspection at least once every 365 days inside and outside the property um, to make sure that you know what conditions there are in the building. If there is any deterioration, you need to ensure that it's safely repaired. You need to safely clean after any work is done, yearly in the common areas and at every change of tenant. 
You need to provide information because just like anything, education is key. So you need, there's a pamphlet, there's disclosure, um, there's a copy of the compliance statement, there's a poster that tells people to report deteriorated paint. All of these things are going to help your tenants and your child care parents um, know how to, the things that they have to do as well to keep their children and families safe. Because it's a two-way street. Everybody has something that they need to do. Um, and to install window well inserts in all of the wooden windows on the property. Those are the basics. We'll go further into detail with these, but these are the basics that the law is going to cover. One of the big takeaways that I really want to stress to you is that all surfaces in a pre-1978 rental property or childcare facility are assumed to have lead unless you can prove otherwise. So you have to treat it all as if it could be lead. The visual inspection, the forms, there's a sample form um, on page 21 and 26 in the IRC course manual. Um, you can use this form, you can create your own, but I do recommend that you use some kind of a form because I don't know if you've ever heard the expression before, if it's not documented, it didn't happen. So document, document, document. Um, you can have a binder or a notebook for each of the separate properties if you own more than one. Um, you can have a file folder, whatever you're doing, but you should always document everything that you're doing in the property and keep that documentation for multiple years. Don't just clean it out at the end of every year. You want to keep it. So what you're looking for when you do the interior visual inspection is deteriorated paint. Deteriorated paint is any kind of non-intact paint. Chipping, peeling, gouge surfaces where a riding toy ran into a door jam, friction marks. So you're looking at the, the areas where window sashes open and close, the window tracks and the sashes, there's going to be friction there. Doors that rub when they open and close, you can see on the door and the door jam that there's friction. Um, cracked or alligatored, you know, if it, you see on the outside where it, it looks like thick, cracked alligator skin, which is why they call it alligatoring. So all of that is deterioration. All of that is non-intact. So that's what you're looking for. And you're looking for equal or greater to a, uh, a square foot of deterioration. And that's, you're, you're looking, so you walk into the living room, you're doing it by room. So you walk into the living room and you're looking at the four walls, you're looking at the baseboard, the windows, the doors, um, the radiators, all of those things that encompass that whole room. And if you look and all told, all totaled up, there's more than a square foot of deterioration in that room, then it has to be fixed. And you're going to look at all areas that are accessible to the tenants. And that means physically accessible to the tenants. You're not, um, if there's an attic space or cellar space or a, or a porch space that that is physically accessible, that counts and you have to look at it. Even if you've told the tenants verbally that they don't have access or whatever, they still have physical uh, access. And we know how sometimes kids don't listen to where they're not supposed to go. So anything that's physically accessible falls under this visual inspection. The only way that you don't have to visually inspect it if it's access is physically blocked. So you have a locked room, a padlock, they, you know, the, the basement door is locked or something like that. Then it doesn't fall under the visual inspection. Everything else does. You need to do this visual inspection at least once a year and at every change of tenant. So at the minimum, you're going to be doing it once a year. Depending on how often that you have a change of tenant, you could be doing it every couple of months. Um, so this is something that you're doing on a regular basis. And if you do find the more than one square foot of deterioration in that room, the, the deterioration must be fixed within 30 days. This is what the sample form in your manual. Um, 
Again, you don't have to use this form, but I would recommend using some kind of form. You can create your own, and this is a pretty good one. You know, it, it records the date, who did it, um, by room, you're looking at the, whether there was no deterioration, whether there was less than a square foot, greater than a square foot, and then if there was greater than a square foot, you're recording when you repaired it and what you did to do the repair. So this is, this is the information that if you don't use this sheet, this is still the kind of the information that you should keep in your documentation. For your exterior visual inspection, um, you're looking at all buildings and, com and components accessible to the tenants. So you're not just looking at the main house, you're looking at the garage, the shed, the fence that surrounds the backyard. All of that, again, is physically accessible to the tenant. If, say, the garage is not for tenant use and the garage door is locked, you wouldn't have to visually check the interior of that garage because it's a locked space, but the exterior of the garage would count um, because it's accessible. And again, you're looking for that one square foot of deterioration in the interior, you're looking per room. On the exterior, you're looking per side. So you're looking at the walls, the corner board, the eaves, around the windows, the foundation, all of those, you're looking at that on one side. And if there's greater than a square foot of deteriorated paint, then um, it must be fixed. If once you do your, your, your visual, um, you have 30 days to fix it, um, just like on the interior. But there is a little difference with the exterior in that if your visual inspection takes place after November 1st, this being Vermont and cold weather when you can't paint. So if you do the visual inspection on the exterior only after November 1st, you have until May 31st of the following spring to have the deteriorating paint stabilized. But you need to do interim controls within that 30 day window. So you don't necessarily have to do the paint stabilization right off, but you do within that 30 day window have to do some kind of interim control that, that keeps tenants safer. And you do this in uh, visual inspection for the exterior at least once a year and again at every change of tenant. So same as the inside. And there is a form in your manual for the exterior visual as well. It's pretty much the same information, the date, who did it, um, and then it's just broken down by side. And there is an area where you can do a little sketch, um, which is kind of a nice thing to do because sometimes the way the grounds look change, so, or a picture um, that you can attach to it as well. But um, you can use this form or create your own, but again, definitely use some kind of documentation. Just to recap, it's all areas inside and outside must be inspected unless they're physically blocked um, access. So just telling people that, hey, you know, don't use that doesn't work. You still got to do the inspection. If there's an area that you don't want tenants to have access to and you don't want to have to include in your visuals, you're going to have to physically block. So lock, locking a room, padlock with a key that they don't have access to as tenants. Um, putting a fence um, around the backside of the building that you don't want tenants to have access to. Something physical has to be done in order for it not to count. Once you do your visual and you've discovered that there is more than a square foot of deterioration per interior room or per side on the exterior, then the paint stabilization occurs. Your job in this is to do the visual and to decide if there's more enough that needs uh, deterioration that, that paint work needs to be done. You cannot do the work yourself with this class. So once it's determined that 
work needs to be done, the property owner must ensure that any surface area over a square foot on the inside per room or outside per side is repaired by somebody who has the Vermont Lead Safe Renovation Repair Painting and Maintenance or RRPM firm and supervisor licenses. So again, this isn't work that with this training that you're taking today, this isn't work that you can do yourself. There is more training that needs to be done in order to do that work. So you either need to take the other training and get the firm and supervisor licenses, or you need to hire somebody who has the RRPM firm and supervisor license. Child care operators, there's, there's a little bit of a difference. They can apply for a free uncompensated child care operator certification so they don't have to do that RRPM firm and supervisor licenses. They would do what's called the UCCO certification to perform the RRPM repairs on just their own daycare. But they still have to take the training. They just don't have the same firm and supervisor license. Those who plan to apply for the RPM supervisor license or the UCCO certification still have to take the training, the RRP training. Then you have to have this IRC training. And then there's also additional Vermont specific RPM worker information that you'll have to review. To learn more about this RPM and how to apply for the credentials, there is a um, link right here that you can click on and learn how to do that. So you want to know if, if you're not doing the work yourself, if you're not going to get RRP certified and do the uh, licensing, and you're hiring somebody, you can check and see that they have their appropriate certification on the Lead and Asbestos Regulatory website. Um, so you can find out if, and, and they should have paperwork on them as well that'll show that they're certified. But it's not just asking people for their certification. You want to make sure they're actually doing the right thing as well. So you need to know, even if you're not doing the work, you need to know what these lead safe RRPM work practices look like. So you're going to want to see and, and talk with them before and even possibly include it in a contract if you have a written a contract with this person. You're going to want to ask them how they're going to set up the work site, how they're going to clean, how they're going to do the work itself. Um, and so you, you would want to talk to them about it, possibly put it in writing, and you're also going to want to check while they're doing the work um, if you're in the area or have somebody check if you're maybe out of state or something um, or just not available that day. But you're going to want to see that they're putting plastic down. Um, inside, they're going to be covering the floors and any furniture that cannot be moved and secure that plastic with tape. Um, they're going to be sealing off doors if they're working in one particular room. They're going to put a door, plastic on that door frame area so that uh, any nothing can ex escape. Um, they're going to be covering the heating and cooling system vents, um, which one of the reasons that you maybe want to do your yearly thing in in construction season when the weather's warm is that you are going to have to shut off the heating system and cover the vents so that contamination doesn't get into there. So it's it's better to be able to do that work um, in the summertime before it gets cold. Um, so they're going to be putting plastic down. They're going to be sealing off things. They're going to have warning signs that alert people that they're doing lead work and not to come into the area. <clears throat> They're going to use lead safe work practices. Um, you're going to want to talk to them about that and make sure they're doing things right. For the exterior work, they're going to be covering the ground with plastic. Um, depending on how close other buildings are, they might be doing vertical containment of plastic versus just horizontal plastic. They might have to actually go up um, a wall or something like that and use vertical plastic. Um, and they're going to be cleaning and securing the area daily. Even if the job lasts for more than a day, they shouldn't just leave everything lying around. They shouldn't leave 
debris around at the end of the day, you're going to want to make sure that they're cleaning up and, and, and tidying up at the, at the end of every workday so that there's no hazards um, available to be gotten into while they're that, not there working. And this is something that you never want to see um, during or after a job. Um, you can see by the dotted line that if they had just put their 10 feet of plastic out, which is what's required, that all of that contamination, all of that um, paint that was scraped onto the ground, it has now con heavily contaminated that soil, would have been caught by the plastic and picked up and disposed of. So practices that contractors, whether you, you're getting certified with the RPM, um, or whether you're hiring somebody to do the work, these are things that nobody can do in any pre-78 properties, no matter what. If you do see any unsafe work practices, um, a neighbor's house, an, another place in town, you're driving somewhere and you happen to see something that you think is unsafe, we will look into your concern if you make a tip and it can be anonymous. So you can submit an anonymous tip to the ALRP, the Asbestos and Lead Regulatory Program on our website and there's also a link in this uh, slide right here that you can click on and submit a tip. And anybody can submit a tip. You can, as a tenant, as a property owner, as a contractor, as Joe Public, anybody can submit a tip that we will look into. So you've done your visual and you've either done the work if you're certified to do the work or you've hired somebody who's certified to do the work. Um, Interim controls are something that you're going to do for exterior problems that are found after November 1st. So remember, if you find a 
greater than a square foot of deterioration per room inside, you have 30 days to fix it. If you find greater than one square foot of deterioration per side of um, outside, you have 30 days to fix it. The only um, exemption to that is if you do your exterior um, visual after November 1st, you have until May 31st, you may have until May 31st, remember May, um, to do the actual painting, but you do have to do some measure within that next 30 days that will mitigate any exposure in the meantime until the paintwork can be done. So in these interim controls are temporary restrictions that can be used on the exterior if cold weather doesn't permit the repair to be made immediately. So you can cover those deteriorated areas. You can put up plastic on the wall or wrap the porch railings with plastic. You can use Tyvex uh, building wrap. You can carpet the porch floors. Um, any, any deteriorated areas, you can just cover them in some way. Um, you can block access, you can put fencing, even that um, snow fencing, six feet away from the deteriorated area, say if it was a foundation area or the side of a building, you can put six feet away from the building, you can put fencing um, that will block access to that area until the, the paintwork can be done. This slide is a picture of some of these interim controls and how they might work. Um, you can see on the, the picture on the left where they put the plastic up and then they took wood and they probably either screwed, nailed, or stapled that wood on, over the plastic. You're going to want to do that because if not, high wind is going to tear the plastic and your interim control is going to break down. So you want to make sure that your interim control is going to actually last. Um, and not just get blown down on the first windstorm. Here's a picture on this slide of on the left a side of the house covered with the building wrap type power. On the right hand picture there's a fence that a landlord put up to block um, access to that siding until the, the siding can be fixed. All repairs must be done on painted or deteriorated painted or stained surfaces by the Vermont RPM licensed person or for somebody doing work in their own daycare, the UCCO certified individual. So again, that can be you if you're doing your own work, but you need, again, more training than just today, or you can hire somebody who's certified. And again, just remember, you may have until May. You may have until May. If the exterior de deterioration is found after November 1st, you have until May 31st to have it stabilized, but you got to do the interim controls within 30 days. So something, inside or outside, something has to be done in 30 days. And then you might have a little bit longer to do the actual painting outside. After the contractor that you've hired does the work, they have to do the cleaning. That's part of their job. You don't want to do their job for them. But there is cleaning that you have to do with this train, uh, with your own properties. And this IRC training allows you to do this particular cleaning. Um, you're going to be doing this cleaning after you do window well inserts, uh, every time there's a change of tenant, and at least once a year in the common areas, if there are common areas in your building. The way you're going to do this cleaning is with a HEPA vacuum and wet washing. It's similar to lead safe work practices in that you don't want things flying around. So you don't want to be dry sweeping, dry dusting. Um, that is all going to cause things to fly around, could poison you as you're doing it, and also it's going to settle into contamination elsewhere. So you're going to be wa uh, using wet washing methods. If you're using a good general cleaner in a spray bottle, paper towels, wipes, um, Swiffers, you're going to spritz an area, scrub it down, mop it with a Swiffer, throw the, the pad away when it's dirty. That's the easiest thing to do. If you are going to use something that is reusable, like a cloth or a sponge or a mop, you're gonna have to have at least, um, 
three buckets, the three bucket method. So you're going to have a cleaning solution, a rinse solution, and an empty. You're going to take your clean mop or your sponge. You're going to put it in your cleaning solution. You're going to clean a little bit. You're going to wring it out into your empty. You're going to put it back in your cleaning solution. I mean, uh, you're going to rinse it out um, in your rinse solution. You're going to wring it out, and then you're going to put it back in your cleaning solution because you don't want to ever put something dirty like a mop or a sponge that you've just cleaned with directly back into your cleaning solution because then you're going to contaminate that solution and you're just going to be moving the lead around rather than actually getting rid of it. So three buckets, cleaning, rinse, empty, or disposable things that you can throw away when they're dirty. You're going to do safe disposal of the dirty water because if you dump it out the back door if you dump it down the sink or the tub you could leave contamination behind so you want to take that dirty water and dump it down the toilet and then you're going to check your work it should be visual visibly clean if you can see dirt you've obviously not cleaned well and you've got to go back and do it again so again you're going to be doing this after your window well inserts, you're going to be doing this every time you have a change of tenant, and you're going to be doing it in the common areas once a year. A HEPA vacuum is something that you're going to need and is something specific. It's not getting using your regular shop vac that you already have and putting a HEPA filter on it, an aftermarket HEPA filter. That is not a HEPA vacuum, that's a shop vac with a HEPA filter. You need a HEPA vacuum. A HEPA vacuum is a vacuum cleaner device with an included, built-in, high efficiency particulate air, or HEPA, filter through which the contaminated air flows. It's um, a much finer filter, especially the exhaust filter because with regular vacuums, if it makes it through the machine, it makes it through the bag, and it gets to that final exhaust filter, if the exhaust filter is not in a good enough filter, it's just going to shoot back out the other end and recontaminate things. So it needs to be a vacuum cleaner that was designed and built as a HEPA vacuum, no aftermarket stuff to jazz up your old thing, and and it has to say HEPA. It's going to say HEPA on the machine. You're, you're probably going to see something that says 99.97% efficient. You might even see 0.3 microns because that's how small those HEPA filters can take down to 0.3 microns. So it should say it on the machine. It should say it in the paperwork. It's going to say it on the box. And you need to operate this according to the manufacturer's instructions. And the big thing with that is making sure that you change the filter as often as they tell you to change the filter. Because if you don't change the filter, it can reduce the abilities of your HEPA vacuum. The biggest takeaway is you're going to need to buy that HEPA vacuum. If the surface isn't going to be disturbed, if it's not loose deterioration if it's just a ding out of a windowsill or a doorway and you don't need to do any prep work to get a good coat of paint because you don't want to just paint over loose paint because then the paint just comes off again very quickly and you've done all that work for nothing and, and the hazard is now there again. But if it is an, a firm surface with just some dings taken out of it, um, it doesn't need any prep work, then no certification is required. Anybody can just slap a coat of paint on something. So if you're just going in and doing a fresh coat of paint on the windowsills or touching up an area and, and you're not going to be, you're going to be doing absolutely no prep, no wet scraping, no wet sanding. Um, you're just going to go in with a paintbrush. That's all you're walking in with is your paint can and a paintbrush. You walk in with everything else, anything else, you need certification. But um, just to paint, no certification required. If you are disturbing that surface, if, if prep work needs to be done, um, there's loose paint, things like that, the Vermont Lead Safe RPM supervisor and firm license is needed to do any work if it's performed in for compensation 
in pre-1978 housing or child care facilities. So this means landlords or property managers, the fact that you receive rent for the property makes it for compensation. Painters, carpenters, plumbers, electricians, weatherization, window replacement, anybody who's disturbing that surface, in it doesn't have to be for the specific purpose of painting. You know, a plumber, an electrician, they're not painting, they're not going in there to paint, but they could be disturbing. They could be taking down a wall, they could be removing baseboard, they can be disturbing these surfaces in the course of their other job. So if they are disturbing anything, they also need to be RPM uh, certified and they have to have the supervisor and firm licensing. The majority of housing in Vermont is pre-1978. You guys probably already know that just looking around. We have some very old houses. We have some of the oldest housing stock in the country. So if you work on housing and child occupied facilities, you are going to need the RRPM or UCCO uh, child care credentials. There's also a soil component to the IRC rule. Um, once it, uh, you need to remove all visible paint chips from the property. So you gotta take a walk around, use your eyeballs, look and see if there's any visible paint chips on the grass, on the bare soil, anywhere around the property. A single paint chip the size of your pinky nail can put a child's blood level over 20, which is considered severely lead poisoned. So don't think that just because it's a little chip, it's not dangerous. It, it, a couple of paint chips can put a kid in the hospital. So you really need to be good about removing all the visible paint chips from the property. You need to do this at least once every 365 days. But if you're around the property more often than that, I would do it more often than that because why not? You're there, take a quick look around before you leave. If there are bare soil areas within two to three feet of the building, we call that the drip line. That drip line, that, that area within a couple feet of the foundation is usually highly contaminated. Even if it's not something you did, it's just, Things have come off the building over the years, um, not just paint chips, but actually if you've ever walked along an old building and run your hand along it and you come away with, with the white chalk on you, that's lead that has come out of the surface and is now um, on top and it rain can wash it down if you've wash the building, it can wash it down in the soil. So that soil within a couple feet of the foundation is very contaminated. So, and it's also a popular play area. A lot of times there's not a big play area around, so they're playing close to the building. Um, if there's a layer of grass, it's protecting you from what's underneath. But if it's bare, it's easily accessible. Kids are gonna play in it. Kids are gonna eat dirt. We all know kids eat dirt. So we recommend that you cover or block access to bare soil areas that are within a couple feet of that foundation line. You can cover it with four to six inches of mulch, stone, new dirt, something like that. You can uh, plant pricky bushes that do not encourage play in that area. You make sure people know as tenants that they cannot grow any vegetables close to the building. Sometimes people want to throw a tomato plant or two in just along the drip line if they don't have a garden area, but um, those plants will suck up the lead out of the soil and then into what you're going to eat. So no edible plantings along the drip line. Um, garden areas should and play areas should be away from buildings. Um, maybe provide a sandbox so the kids have a safe controlled place to play in the dirt versus finding their own place which could be close to the building. Um, garden soils, it's actually a good idea if you haven't had your soil tested and you don't know if there was an old building there previously, raised bed gardens are a great option. And don't forget under the porch. Um, 
Under the porch is usually close to the building, so it's highly contaminated and it makes a really fun play area. It's like a little clubhouse, if you don't mind spiders and things like that. So I recommend you use lattice work or something like that to block off underneath the porches so that kids can't get under there. If there's bare soil within a few feet of the foundation, we recommend that you cover it. You're going to need to install what, what's called a window well insert in all wooden windows that were constructed before 1978. So if the wooden windows in the building were constructed before 1978, then you need to do a window well insert. The window well insert is something that is smooth, cleanable, and durable. This is the big three, and these this is very, very important that whatever material you use for those window well inserts fits all three of these criteria. It needs to be smooth, it needs to be cleanable, it needs to be durable. Most people use aluminum coil stock. It's relatively easy to work with. It's easy to cut. It's relatively cheap. Um, but you can really use anything as long as it fits all three of those criteria. I've seen people try to use aluminum foil. It's smooth, it's cleanable, it's not durable, doesn't fit the three. Um, extra vinyl siding you have laying around. A lot of the vinyl siding has texture. So it is durable, but it is not smooth and cleanable. So it's got to fit all three of those properties and um, aluminum coil stock does that. And in your manual, the IRC course manual on pages 35 to 50 is a visual um, walkthrough of every step of the process of doing a window well insert. This picture is what the window well is because sometimes there's a little confusion. I've had people wrap the entire interior window sill, that's not needed. The window well, if it's a double hung window, it's a very obvious location. It's the area between the inside and the outside window sashes. That area in between where the dead flies hang out, where all the paint chips are, um, that's the window well if you've got an inside and an outside window sash. Um, so it's not the windowsill interior, it's not the windowsill exterior, it's that area in between those two windowsill uh, sashes. If there are, isn't an exterior window sash, so you've just got your inside window and then space until the exterior sill ends, then the window well is the area that that sash sits on, that single window sash, when you close the window where that sash sits, that's considered the window well and that's what has to be covered for a window well insert. So even if you don't have double hung windows, there is an area that you're going to need to cover with this insert. Cut the aluminum coil stock or whatever smooth, clean and, and cleanable and durable material that you're using, you're going to cut it to fit the area, you're going to dry fit it so to make sure it fits. And I don't recommend that you cut a whole bunch ahead of time um, unless you know for sure you've measured all your windows and they're all exactly the same. Because in old houses, what I've discovered a lot of times is that sometimes all the windows on a single floor can be very different, or sometimes on different floors they can be different sizes. So don't get ahead of yourself and cut everything out ahead of time unless you know it's going to fit. So you cut it, you dry fit it just to make sure it fits, and then you use liquid nails to attach the window well insert to the window well itself. Once you've put it in there with the liquid nails, you're going to caulk around all the edges. Again, you don't want any water to get underneath in any way because it's going to then rot out the wood. So you're going to caulk all the edges, the full horizontal around the little, <clears throat> excuse me, around the window tracks. You're, you're going to caulk the entire area. One thing you want to make sure you don't do though is cover the weep holes. So when you have two window sashes, there's usually little holes underneath the outside window sash 
that allow any rain and moisture that comes in to escape back out. So when you're caulking around your edges, make sure you don't cover these weep holes because again, you'll have water ponding in there and possibly if there is any little crack or crevice, it's gonna seep in there. So don't cover your weep holes when you caulk. Um, and if you notice that the weep holes were already covered in the past, drill them back out or something. So the window well inserts must be put into all pre-78 wooden windows if they were manufactured to open. So bay windows, um, screw out windows, sliding windows, those don't have window wells. But regular wooden windows, they have a well. And again, it's in between the two window sashes or where the single window sash sits. Once you've done your window well insert and cleaned, or if you've been doing your change of tenant cleaning or your once a year common area cleaning, you're gonna have to get rid of your garbage. So I recommend contractor garbage bags. They're heavier duty, they're bigger, you can fit a lot in there. Um, you're gonna gooseneck, what's called goosenecking the bags. So rather than filling it up all the way to the top so that you don't really have anything to grab at the top, you're gonna to leave some space at the top. You're going to grab that space, kind of twist it up close to where the garbage reaches. You're going to tape around that part. So now you're gonna have your bulging area of garbage. You're gonna have your neck that's taped around and there's gonna be more garbage bags sticking up. You're gonna take that part of the garbage bag that's still sticking up, and you're gonna bend it over so it looks like a goose neck and you're gonna tape it again. So now you have a little U taped at the top so that you can carry your garbage bag around. And if you drop that garbage bag, nothing's going to be able to escape out the top. So that's why you gooseneck. You have it up and then you bend it over, you break the goosenecks and you, and you tape it around so that if you drop something, nothing can poof out of the top. And waste disposal is just like camping. If you bring it in, you bring it out. You don't leave it in the tenant's garbage can under the sink. Um, you don't leave it in the garbage can that's just in the garage. Um, Mostly you're probably going to bring it with you at the end of the job and then you can dispose of it with your household pickup or you can bring it directly to the transfer station. If you do have a um, dumpster or something on site that, that is yours, then you can put it in there, but you don't wanna leave it anywhere where if the garbage gets, um, gotten into by a raccoon and gets strewn around that now there's lead hazards around or the tenants, the bag breaks and the tenants are now exposed. So generally you're gonna wanna bring it out with you. But um, if you do have a lockable trash receptacle on site, you can put it there as well. These posters, either need to be put up in a common area or in each individual unit if there is no common area. When it's in each individual unit, because um, one of the things you hear a lot is that everybody takes these posters down. So you can, for in an individual unit, um, get those sheet protectors, um, put the poster in there, put the pamphlet that, you're, that you have to give, the EPA protect your family from lead in the home, put the pamphlet in there, a copy of your compliance statement, you can put that in there as well. Tack it on the inside of a kitchen cupboard and they're gonna see it when they open the kitchen cupboard, but it's not gonna be out and obvious and they'd be less likely to take it down. In a common area, they get taken down a lot because they get curled up and dirty and people just don't like the looks of them or the door opens and the wind blows it off the, the tack that you had it stuck on. So for a common area you wanna do, you can laminate them and make them sturdier and then uh, tack them up or you can get a cheap uh, picture frame, put it behind there, um, looks a little nicer. 
people are less likely to take it down. The pamphlet that you have to give out, it's a federal as well as a state rule, is the EPA pamphlet, Protect Your Family from Lead in the Home. You need to give it to every prospective tenant and any new tenant. You can include it inside the kitchen cabinet with the poster. The pamphlet is online um, at the link here. And again, you can um, get it in PDF form, send it somewhere to have it printed for you, or you can... Um, buy them all nicely colored and everything from the EPA. And it's uh, page 67 of the IRC course manual. You can print it out yourself from that. And it's on our website as well. Education and information is key. And it really is a two-way street. When I go out um, and look at a property, the landlord has certain things that they're supposed to do. They're supposed to keep the paint in good shape, make sure everybody's certified, use safe work practices, lead safe cleaning, um, basic maintenance. Um, tenants need to know that they should take their shoes off of the door, that they shouldn't let their kids wander with food, that they um, that there is the possibility that it's an old building and they should be careful and, and be aware that you know, it's not cute that your kid is teething on the windowsill, that it could be actually dangerous that your child is teething there. So education goes both ways, and the more everybody knows, the less likely there is to be a problem. The compliance statement is the final thing, and with this IRC training, this is something you do. Um, and you're certified to do based on this training. So the compliance statement after all the physical stuff, the visual, the work, the cleaning done all by the appropriately certified people, um, this compliance statement is something that's done either by the owner or the designated property manager and it's your final statement that you did what the law required. It needs to be submitted at least once every 365 days. A copy needs to go to the tenant either physically or through an email um, within 10 days of the compliance statement being completed. The link is in the documents. You create an account. So you, you have to go in. You can't just go in and immediately do your compliance statement. The first thing you have to do is go in and create an account. After you create an account, you will receive an email and you have to click the link on that email within three days and you get back in and then you can add your properties and file the compliance statement. You need to use the E911 address for the property so it's not the corner of state and Maine, it's whatever your E911 address is, 123 Main Street, whatever. Um, and you, again, it needs to be either the property owner themselves or their designated property manager and they can't, it has to be a uh, designated manager that's also in the database. So if you're a property manager, you have to go into this electronic system and create an account. And then the owner has to go in, choose you as their designated property manager, and then you can do the compliance statement. So, but it needs to be one of those two people, either the owner or their designated property manager. And you must file this compliance statement at least once every 365 days. After this training, this is what you are and what you are not. You are IRC certified to comply with the Vermont Lead Poisoning Prevention Law. You can do the visual. You can do the um, window well inserts. 
You can do the cleaning after window well insert installation. You can do the cleaning of the common areas once a year. You can do the cleaning um, at change of tenant. That's what you can do. You are not certified to do the work or the cleaning after the work um, if you find more than one square foot of deterioration and work needs to be done. That's not you, but you can do all the other stuff. So you're IRC certified. You are not a licensed lead inspector risk assessor. You are not a licensed lead abatement contractor, and you are not RPM or UCCO credentialed. This class is Vermont specific and only provides RRC certification, nothing else. If you are leasing a residential rental property, um, there are lead paint disclosure requirements. So you own a residential rental property built before 1978. What do you have to do federally and statewide to educate tenants and let them know the possibilities? So before you have people move in, you need to give people that protect your family from lead in the home pamphlet that has a lot of information for them. You need to provide them with a copy of the most recent IRC, IRC compliance statement that we just talked about. And there's federal disclosure. You basically have a disclosure document that we will see in a minute that says, has a stock statement of pre-78 building, there could be lead. If you've ever had any testing, sample results, water, soil, dust, if you've ever had XRF reporting, anything like that, that is something that you check off on that form and you share with the tenants. This is the form. So you can see the statement at the top, housing built before 1978 may contain lead-based paint basic statement just so that people some people especially I think younger people they they didn't grow up with the idea of lead and they think it's been so long since there was lead paint that it's just not an issue anymore so it's good to make people aware that hey, it's an old building there could be lead and then the lease or that's you um, as the owner you say either there is known lead based paint or paint hazards and you check that off or you, that you have no knowledge, which if you've never had it tested, you have no knowledge. And then, so you check one of those for A. For B, that's if you, again, have any records or report. Like if I've ever visited your property and done a lead inspection, you're gonna have a report. So you either check off that you provided it or that you didn't have any records. And then the leasee, that's the renter, they initial that they received, all of the information listed above and you sign that you sign it date it they sign it and date it if there's an agent involved they sign it and date it this is federal disclosure it is a federal requirement um, I would add this page to your written lease or a copy to the tenants if it's not in the lease and a link to this is included in our manual. This lead disclosure to tenants is the federal law and it carries very stiff fines for non-compliance. There's also disclosure at real estate transactions. So if in Vermont, um, when you're, when a rental house built before 1978 is sold, and this includes single family homes and multi-unit buildings. If it is a single family home being used as a rental, it still has to um, follow these real estate transaction and disclosures. So the seller must provide the buyer with educational materials explaining the inspection, repair, and cleaning, or IRC obligations. So we want the next person to know what they need to do. The seller must also disclose to the buyer whether the IRCs have been completed. And if they have been completed, you need to give them a copy of that compliance statement. The sellers must ensure that the rental disclosure form is signed by the seller and the buyer and sent to the Department of Health. There is a specific form that has to be filled out for these pre-78 residential rental properties when it's going through the real estate transaction. 
The sellers need to disclose any lead paint pay inspection or risk assessment report, letter of exemption. So if, if it was tested by a licensed lead inspector with an XRF machine, you would have gotten, and no lead paint was found, you would have gotten a letter. That letter of exemption you would give to the buyer, an assurance of discontinuance if, if there was any problems and an assurance of discontinuance was part of the order, any administrative orders, court orders, all of that is disclosable. If you're buying a rental, residential rental property built before 1978 and it's not in compliance with the IRC rule, you have 60 days to bring it into compliance. If it can't happen within that 60 days, you would have to uh, request an exemption and it can be granted for good cause. Failure to bring the property into compliance carries a mandatory civil penalty.